great. So not only are we in this room, we're also live streaming to some people online. Hello, everyone online. Hello, guys. Um, and that's because there's people all over the country that are super interested in what we're talking about today, which is very, very exciting. Um, thank you all for coming so far. It's been, um, it's been a journey to get to this point. Uh, I've been involved in this for, for four years, and uh, this is a step of, uh, I think, uh, something substantial to say that if the people just in this room collaborated using what we're talking about today, uh, I think we could see something quite special happening, um, and it will change the industry in a, in a really brilliant way. Um, so, without further ado, um, the way that this is going to work today, it's a bit of collaborative uh, work, so we're going to try and break you guys into groups in the tables. Um, those groups are if you kind of split your table in two, so the left and the right-hand side. Um, some of the conversations will be, or the left-hand side, um, some of the conversations will be in the group, and then sometimes, then, and then we're going to bring that to the, the whole room. And the way we're going to bring the information from your group to the whole room is using something called Slido, which you'll see there and there. So, to get you guys ready for this, uh, at the very start of this event, if you could go to slido.com on your mobile device, this is how you're going to interact and provide information to us. Um, everything you put into Slido, we'll be able to see. So even if we don't get to talk about the particular issue that you've raised through that today, we'll, we'll be able to see that and um, um, react to it uh, at a later date if needed. Um, so if you go to slido.com on your mobile device, when you've done that, you'll see that you can type in Open Active in the little box that appears. So if you type that in, um, and then you will see our first um, poll. So this is our uh, commercial director at the ODI, uh, David. I should introduce myself. I'm Nick Evans, uh, worker in Open Active at the ODI. Um, and uh, what we're going to, uh, to ask you is, uh, commercial director tried to book a badminton court near his hotel. How long did it take? Uh, two minutes, 30 seconds, five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or he gave up. So when you've got in there, you should, if you press the magic button, uh, you should see on that appears some options. Can you see that on your, on your app? Everybody see that come up? Those options have appeared. You can choose which one you think the answer is. And online as well, you guys, that's on this side of your screen. So if you click on one of the options here and press the button, then you can vote. So you can see at the top right-hand corner here, 26 people voted so far. Let's see if we can get more people in the room. 30, that's half the room, some guys online. Let's see if we can get to, we've got 40 so far. And the great thing is if you're in a small group, when you put your information into this, you can do that through your group as well. So if you're not comfortable using the device or you can't figure out how to use it or something, as long as you get the person in your group to submit that information, then you can do it that way too. Uh, great, 48 people. More, we're gonna break 50, two more people? Yes, we have, fantastic. Okay, so should we um, show the results? What do people think? He gave up. <laughs> Excellent, and the right answer is? He gave up. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Well done, guys. Uh, so uh, a couple more, um, because we'll get quicker. The first time always takes a bit of time. So the next question, if we go to the next poll, is uh, what's the estimated economic benefit of open data, which is what we're talking about today, um, in transport? So this has already happened in transport, and particularly in London, just, just in London. What's the economic benefit of what we're talking about today in London? Uh, you've got some options there. 20 already, so we got much quicker. Brilliant. Uh, that's a great question. I don't know where this stat. <laughs> that's a good point. That's, what do you reckon it is, over four years? Is it each year? OK, let's go each year. Annual benefit. Broke 50, nearly. Where are those two others from before? Go on. Are you guys online, this side? There we go, perfect, 51. Okay, and the, and the uh, results were? And again, uh, absolutely right. So the answer is exactly 130 million. You might have seen these slides before. Um, and the next question, and final question, see if we can get that to 56 really quickly, maximum engagement. Uh, what percentage of state-funded primary schools are engaged in Change for Life? You might have heard of Change for Life. Uh, they're working with Open Active 
to put their data onto an activity finder, which is in their website. Uh, what percentage of state-funded primary schools are engaged in Change for Life? Go on, let's hit 50. Quick, 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 quick. 41. And you guys online that side? If you've just joined, uh, if you vote on the poll on, the, on, on that side of your screen. Great. Broken 50 again. Fantastic. So, what, what does everyone think? 78%. Interesting. And then 50. And the correct answer is 98%. Even bigger opportunity than we thought it was. So um, that's great. Thank you, Tara. Brilliant. So that's, that is. So the agenda for today, uh, this is the introductory section. So what we're going to do is we're going to explain open data just to make sure that anybody who hasn't already had this kind of introduction to what this is can catch up. Um, or if maybe you've heard about it through other people, this is an opportunity to hear it for the first time um, using uh, Richard Norris, who is the best person to present this information to you. Um, and uh, then after that, we're going to talk about booking, uh, just a summary of that. So that's why we're here today, obviously, and the, the, the main topic of the conversation. So we're going to cover that information. Um, so you've got an idea of exactly what this looks like, so you can picture it. After that, we're going to break for lunch. It's a half-hour lunch break. And then we're going to do this booking finalization, part one and two. We're going to cover various topics of booking, um, just to make sure that everybody in the room is comfortable with what we're doing, how it's working, understands the opportunity this presents, and also any limitations that are um, that we've kind of traded off as we've gone through that process. Um, and uh, there's a tea break in between that, so hopefully that'll give you an opportunity to uh, relax because um, there's quite a lot to take in. Um, and uh, and then we're gonna we're gonna close at half past four. Um, so uh, during lunch, the lunch is if you haven't already been in here, served upstairs as a mezzanine floor, and you can go up there in the break as well. It's a good chance to chat and get to know people. Um, in this network if you haven't already. So, I'm going to hand over to Izzy from Sport England, who is going to give you a background of what we're all doing. So yeah, for those of you who I haven't met before, my name's Izzy, I'm a Data and Innovation Manager at Sport England, and I look after Open Active from our side. So to give you a bit of background on who Sport England is, just in case you haven't come across us before, uh, we are the kind of government's delivery agent for sport and physical activity in England. And our vision is that everyone in England, no matter who they are, what their background, their age, their level of ability, feels able to engage in sport and physical activity. So it's really important to us that this is a really kind of open agenda. And why, what is the problem that we're facing at the moment? So... Only 62% of people get their recommended 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise. So there's a huge gap in those inactive or fairly active, as we say, people who could be doing more and who could be getting more active. So you might have heard of This Girl Can. That's our campaign about getting more women active because we know that women find it more difficult to have, face more barriers than others to get active. So we know that women are kind of face a lot of emotional barriers, but there are also practical barriers. And those practical barriers include finding the information online because it's really hard to find that information locally, to find relevant activities, to know whether something's going to be right for you. And as consumer expectations are changing, women need to see more and different things to make them feel like they can take part in something. And we can see that more and more consumers are expecting people to understand their needs up front. They don't want to have to work hard to find information that's relevant to them. They want it there at the touch of their fingertips. <coughs> now, sometimes I think as a sector, we get accused of delivering this experience. Not ideal, some might say. Um, and I know that a lot of people in this room are working really hard to make that better and make that user experience much more of a straightforward, easy process to really engage better with your customers. But this is something where open data can really help you to not have to worry about giving this not ideal experience that we might see here. I think the other thing to note is that consumers now expect will give you feedback in this kind of way on Twitter. 
and get quite a lot of likes, you might see down there as well. At Sport England, open data also fits into kind of a wider vision we have. So we think that our wider ambition is to help modernize our sector. And through the power of data innovation, we think that that can really help get people active. So how are we going to do this? We want easy to access information. That's where open data fits into this. But we also think that we as a sector can provide better personalized experiences, new innovative solutions, and have that better real-time feedback response to consumers. That includes online booking and services. And we also think that there could be better rewards and incentives and better tailored relevant offers, more collaborative ways of working. So as Sport England, part of what we see is kind of developing as a sector this shared ambition and commitment to that ambition building the essential infrastructure of which open data really forms a key building block we want to grow our innovations ecosystem whether that's working with startups many of whom are in the room today or you know enabling the more established businesses to do some innovation themselves and really that involves embedding a digital mindset so thinking more digitally thinking digital first and I think what a key thing we also need to deliver as a sector, as Open Active, is really showing the value and the return on investment. We know a lot of you have put a lot of hard work into this initiative, and I can thank you so much for that here. Um, and we think that there's more to come and that you will start to see the fruits of your labor over the next kind of six months to a year. But before we kind of run, let's make sure we can walk. Let's remind ourselves of who that consumer is, why we're delivering Open Active, that we can provide a better service to them today. Thanks. So before, <coughs> before Richard explains the, uh, uh, the open data detail, I thought if you guys hadn't really watched this, we'd give you an opportunity to do this in, uh, in cinematic uh, surround sound. It's not quite as it's stereo, but it's almost there. Uh, so we're just going to give you the opportunity to watch this again. If you haven't already, and for those online, um, this is available on our website. If you want to explain what we're talking about today to anybody, we recommend just showing them this. Open data has the potential to revolutionise our industry. It can attract more customers, make your activities easier to find and book, and encourage more people to get active. Simply put, open data means you can reach more customers. It's basically free marketing. Let me show you how. The travel industry shares data really well. This means that websites like lastminute.com, Skyscanner and Expedia get up-to-date and accurate information about flights and hotels from most providers easily. These services offer variety and convenience to consumers and as a result, the travel providers reach way more customers. OpenActive wants to do the same for our industry. Our mission is to help more people get active. We're a community of organisations and individuals, backed by the government, working together to help promote the benefits of open data and help create common standards so that we're all speaking the same language. To be clear, open data means information like timings, prices, location, availability, descriptions and images. Details that are probably already public, not personal information about your customers. Sounds great, but what does it all look like? Well, you may already use a booking system to list your activities online. Opening your data is usually just as simple as ticking a box in the settings. Innovators and businesses can use your data in amazing ways, like featuring your activities and facilities in apps and websites that attract millions of users or through communities and services that engage local people, but also in new, incredible ways that we can't imagine yet. Using your data, they're automatically kept up to date without any extra effort from you. <laughs> Discovering and booking your activities will be easier than ever. So many have already begun to embrace open data and are reaping the benefits. Whether you're an individual or an organisation, open your data. Increase your engagement. Grow your attendance. And help more people.
Boo-Boo, get active! Great, right? Um, that tick box at the end is really significant. You'll see why uh, a little bit later on. Um, it's not just a pretty tick box. Uh, before we continue, and I introduce up Richard, could you guys at the back please come and sit down at the front? I'm sorry that you're, uh, you've are you had to stand just there, but it'd be great to get you involved. There's, a, there's at least four seats around here. Um, if you guys could let them through, that would be amazing. Sorry about that. Slight disruption. Okay, so let me introduce uh, Richard, who is the program lead on, uh, on Open Active at the Open Data Institute. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to see so many of you here today. Um, as Nick said, like, this is I think, a really exciting moment where we can bring you all together and, and, and um, push this initiative on a bit further. Um, so I just want to give a bit of a scene setting of what Open Active actually is, because I think some of you are, are newer to this than others, perhaps. So, as Nick said, this would... It's kind of a good kind of starting point, really. And Open Active really is all about behavior change, which is a really difficult challenge that we all think about quite a lot. And we tend to refer to a model that Sporting and use called the, the COM-B model. And it basically helps you understand behavior change. If you want to get somebody to be more physically active on a regular basis, there's three different levers that, that we think you should be thinking about. There's the capability of that individual. So are they physically able to take part in that activity? Are they, are they the right age? Are they the right gender? Um, can, they, can they actually do it? There's the opportunity. So does the opportunity exist for them to get active? Is there the, the session or the class or the running route or the instructor? Does, is, is there something they can actually do that's near the house that they can, that they can get to? And is that individual being motivated in the right way to, to take part in that activity? So is the, is the activity being displayed to them in a way that makes them feel like it's for them, like there's other people like them that are taking part in activities. Is the image right? Is the description right? Are you helping them think that it's something they really want to do? Are you inspiring them to take part in an activity? And if you don't address each of those three levers, you can't really change somebody's behavior. So you can't really make somebody or, or help somebody become more physically active. And I guess the focus for Open Active, really, it's, it's the glue between the opportunity and the, and the motivation. And open data is the way that we think we can, we, can, we can bridge that gap. So open data is data that anybody can access, use, or share. So putting your timetables online in a format that people can get to with a license that says they can use that data, they can use that information without having to ask your permission. That's really the, the kind of core of what Open Active is about. In order to bridge that gap between the opportunity, so the thing that, that, that you as activity providers deliver day in, day out, and the kinds of services, the kinds of apps or products that can motivate people more effectively than, than, than perhaps has been possible before. So open data is, is, is the kind of plumbing between these two things. So getting the timetables from, from activity providers like GLL or uh, Table Tennis England in a format, in a structure, through a mechanism that means those, those uh, products and services on the right-hand side can start using that information to, to help more people get active. And the reason why we think openness is kind of fundamental to, to, to making this work well is because it, it, it reduces the barrier for those innovators, for those services looking to create exciting things that get people active. And it, and it means that you can have a whole range of different things that, that can be built. So it's not all about commercial aggregators, although they have a great role to play in this, in this ecosystem. There's national campaigns like Change for Life, which Nick has already mentioned, uh, like This Girl Can, which Izzy's mentioned. Uh, there are use cases like social prescribing, employee well-being, insurance. There's an almost limitless number of ways in which that information can get used to appeal to a different kind of person. So it's not about creating a one-size-fits-all activity finder that's going to work for everybody. It's about creating the conditions in which lots of things can be created that can be tailored to a specific audience, to a specific demographic, and motivate those people in different ways because we know that in order to change behavior, there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution that's going to work for everybody. So open data is basically taking the timetables from, the, from those organizations on the left-hand side and helping those organizations on the right-hand side use it. And then bookability, which is why you're all here today, is to then help, help close the gap for that, for that user between, between, the most, between the thing that they're looking at and the activity that they want to take part in. 
And open data is, is I mean, it's a, a fairly new concept, I guess, for many in the, in, in the room. Um, but it's, in other sectors, it's, it's a concept that's already yielding lots of value for lots of different people. And an example that we like to cite is the one that Nick had in the poll earlier this morning, which is transport. So in London, Transport for London, who, you know, many of you will have used the tube or the bus to get here today. Transport for London run that infrastructure. That's, that's, their, that's their focus, right? It's making, making those trains time, uh, arrive on time, making that system work smoothly. But they publish their timetables. They publish the availability, the, the live tracking of that, of, of that travel infrastructure as open data so that innovators can start using it. And there's a recent report into the, the value of that that's been created for the city as a whole, <clears throat> and it's £130 million pounds per year. And that's value in efficiency savings for Transport for London, it's value through jobs that have been created by those innovators, um, and in you know, time saved for people getting from A to B. And the, the, the example that people tend to cite the most of a great use case for that data is, is City Mapper, which um, I use pretty much on a daily basis just to make sure that I can get to work on time. Um, and some of you may have used to get here today. And they can focus on creating an app that is, uh, you know, the, the, the user experience in that app is, is designed seamlessly, is, is, is a great experience for that customer. That's, that's their focus, right? They're not focused on providing the activity or they're providing the, the, the travel infrastructure. That's Transport for London's core focus. And in the context of open data, uh, open active, the big use case that we've got at the moment um, is Change for Life. And I think many of you will be aware that, that, that they've launched that Activity Finder. They're looking to do a big push over the summer on that. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of, of Change for Life, they've got 4 million people signed up to that campaign. So it, 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 it's a brand that people recognize. It's a place that people go to to find things to do for their kids over the summer. But there are more things like Change for Life that, <clears throat> that are going to start appearing this year. So this girl can. Um, uh, there are other data users, and I think a few of them are in the room that uh, would like to talk to the activity providers in the room that are going to start using this data in exciting ways over, over the year. And just to be really clear on the open data side about what gets published, it's, it's, it's information, it's data that's, that's usually on an activity, activity provider's website already. So it's, it's essentially what will go into your timetable. It's, it's the description of, of that activity, it's the name of that activity, it's the image that helps you understand what that activity is. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's data about events or, or sessions or courses, it's the things that you're trying to sell, right? So making the data about those things that you're trying to sell open, getting them more visible in more places is a good thing. So that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour through what Open Active is about. Um, we've got a bit of time for some Q&A, and then we'll move a bit more into focusing on booking. So we just thought it'd be good before we get into the booking side, because there's a real clean separation between open data and bookability, just to make that really, really clear. This is the first step. Step one is open data. Step two is bookability. Just as an opportunity for everyone in the room to really just get into this, this particular topic. And if there's any other questions that you have around this that you've been thinking about for a while, maybe, or something that you've just, just has come to you while Rich has been talking, it'd be great to surface those here. So what we'd love to do is for those in the, in the room, if you could get on in your tables into a group on the left and the right hand side of the tables, as we explained before, so a small group of three or four. So that's one on the left and one on the right of the tables. Um, and just uh, in that group, talk through open data, so what do you think about it? Is that, is that good? Is it, a, is it a good thing? Are there any challenges that you see? Is there uh, any questions that you have about it that you would like answered here? And the answer might be no, it's great, and you're all going to say, yeah, love open data, and it's ding, 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 and then that's brilliant. That's the best outcome, and we can go to lunch early. Uh, or it might be that there's anyone in the, in the groups that says, oh, actually, I'm not really sure. And in your group, you might solve that problem, because there's enough people here who have kind of gone through this journey already. But if there's a challenge, like I said, this is a good time to talk about that before we get into the step two, because there's no point doing step two until we're happy with step one, right? Um, so yeah, if I could ask you now, we're going to just take five minutes in your groups online. There's a, there, you're in a room online that you can, am I here? Yeah, um, so if you, if, you get, if you hit that link in the top corner uh, and join one of the online rooms, uh, you can do the same thing, have the same conversation as what's happening in the room, um, and um, then we'll service up those questions. So at the end of those five minutes, what we'd love you to do is go on Slido and just put your questions into Slido. It might be there's none, which is great. It might be some, and that's also fine. Um, so please, five minutes if you could. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much.
So we've actually got some questions. Uh, you can see them just over there on the screen. Um, and uh, so there's only four, which is great. Um, so we can move a bit quicker through this content. Um, and, uh, and so the first one uh, we thought we would talk about is the, uh, is, is the top one on this list here. So if you can see that. Uh, what data evidence is there from early adopters around increased uptake utilization after opening up data? Richard. So the short answer to this is we don't actually have any evidence yet on that question. And the reason why is it's, it's quite early days still to, to have that evidence base that we, that, uh, we can give you a clear answer. Um, that's partly why Public Health England are really keen on using booking as part of Change for Life. So it's kind of a non-commercial use case for booking. And the reason why they're particularly interested in booking is to help them track the effect effectiveness of that campaign in a way that they've not been able to previously. Um, we do know that there are you know, some innovators in the room that um, have evidence on, on a, on a third-party data user increasing bookings, but that's not through open data. So it's not something that we've kind of pushed through open active. So hopefully that kind of semi-answers the question. I don't think it does. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so the, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have that evidence yet. So there's over 20 different publishers, and there's about 170,000 sessions per month in that data set. We, we took a decision as a program initially to focus on getting that data published before we really started engaging the, the kind of data user community. So if you think of the two sides of the ecosystem, we focused more initially on building that infrastructure, getting that data there so people could use it. And the focus now is very much on increasing the use of that data and, and booking as part of that. Does Sport England's Data and Innovation Manager have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, so absolutely, we need to prove that value. That's an absolute must for this round of Open Active. And what we're going to be doing through this is small, which we won't talk about today because this is focused on the detailed specifications for booking. But part of this phase of Open Active that we're moving into is focused on specific test and learn projects where we can start to demonstrate that value back. So can we prove that more people have turned up to sessions? Can we prove that we're reaching different kinds of people? What kind of things do we need to prove back? Other pieces of value do we need to prove back to data users, data publishers, different people within our ecosystem? So it is an outstanding question, but it's one I'm hoping that in the next few months we'll start to have better answers to. Probably also worth saying that I think that the the value of um, of making the data open is one of those things that because because the number of people using it is something that's hard to track, it's hard to measure that without the booking side being there. So obviously booking will give us a very clear view of conversions. With just open data alone, in general, it's hard to track exactly what that looks like, especially during the early stages. When it's later on and we've got things like with, you've got with, with Transport and City Mapper, you've got very obvious use cases and you can ask those companies what value they're generating. Um, but at the moment, we're at the stage with a lot of these open data sets where people are coming to us. Um, some people who haven't, um, couldn't make it today, unfortunately, but, uh, but you know, for example, have said to us, oh, yeah, we, of course we're using the data. Um, but then when we say, well, would you want to come into the room and talk about the value you're getting, they're not so interested in doing that. So, um, but that's, that's kind of okay, though, because the point of open data is that we let people innovate at different rates. And this is very early in that journey. Um, so long story short, if we do booking, we will get a very clear view of value from everybody. Um, and before that, we're going to try harder to track that where we can with the partners that are engaged. Well, still not convinced. We'll talk about it at lunch. Okay. Um, so uh, another, another question uh, is around um, what role did the ODI play in opening up airline uh, data for business, for, for travel? So Lee, do you want to take that? Yeah, hello, uh, I'm Lee Dodds. Uh, I'm the Director of Advisory at the ODI, so I'll try and fill this question. Um, so at the ODI, we've worked in lots of different sectors. So we've worked in uh, engineering, agriculture, pharmaceuticals, quite broadly. In terms of our work in the travel sector, um, we haven't worked on opening up airline data, but we have worked with the Department of Transport looking at increasing access to things like uh, bus timetables, uh, driving innovation in airline around use of other types of data. Um, so, for example, how people move through airports. So, hopefully that answers that question. Okay, great. Um, 
How do we get more traction uh, through affiliates, aggregators in receiving bookings? Um, I think this might be a good one to pick up actually in the next session around bookings. Um, Dean, if I can't see. Um, hello, hi Dean. Uh, but yes, let's cover that. Let's cover that in the next session. Um, uh, and how do we get more organizations to pull British Triathlon's data? So I think that's a, that's a similar thing uh, in terms of, well, it's, it's kind of, it's not related to bookings, but that's about making sure that we can get as many, I think it's to Tim's point, um, the, we're trying to, the, the first step of this is to get the data out there and then it's to get the data used and all the use cases that come from that. Um, I think it's probably important to say that the reason that this room is so full is because when you turn on booking, suddenly the interest in using data gets multiplied by quite a large number. Um, we've seen that across everyone we're talking to. Some people even say to us, we're not even going to talk to you until you've got booking. When you've got booking, we'll have a conversation, some of the bigger organizations especially. And so I think it's probably the case to say that um, uh, we, we are absolutely working to grow the number of people using data, um, and we think that will grow even more when we've got booking involved in that as well. Um, So duty of care in terms of promoting uh, activities regarding quality and safeguarding. Uh, Anne-Marie, what does that, what is that? It's more from the other side in terms of, sorry. It's more from the other side in terms of once we start to bring this data in and start to promote it from a local authority's perspective, if we're advertising a session for young people via our, our websites, what, what assurances can we give the residents? We, it's more to bring it to the attention of potentially other local authorities that when it's advertised on your website, the consumer or the resident doesn't see the provider behind it. They just see your face in terms of mine's Manchester City Council. So as a mum, if you were sending your child there, you would assume that certain quality assurance and safeguarding will be put in place. It's not, you know, it's not the same as booking a flight, if that makes sense. So it was more just to, it's something we're coming across through our project in case it was other people starting to think that. Yeah. So that's Public Health England obviously are responsible for making sure that uh, activities that they display in Change for Life meet those safeguarding requirements because um, they kind of have that duty of care, right? If, they're, if people are using that service to find activities, then it's, they're responsible to make sure that that's, the things they're finding are safe. Um, so they don't just take like a, a raw feed of all the data that's ever been published and put that into Change for Life, they, they're quite meticulous in making sure that it's cleaned up and that the kinds of organisations they're displaying in Change for Life meet those, thresh that meet, meet those kind of safeguarding requirements. Um, so that's something they're working with, with Nish and the team that I'm in on. Sorry, I, I don't think there's anything to stop the growth uh, um, setting up and taking that data, is there? So yeah, you're right, Ch Change for Life are obviously organization and uh, are going to use that data appropriately but is there a risk that um, you know some other broker just turns up and starts using your, your data so because so if you're an activity provider and you publish your timetable openly so you, you set up your open data feed yeah you put an, a license on that that says that anybody can come along and, and use that data so people don't need to ask permission to use it and and, and yeah, you will get a whole load of different people that, that can use that data. And that's the same in, in transport. Anybody can use that, those, those bus timetables to create what they want. The, the open data feed doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily the thing that, that allows them to do that or doesn't allow them to do that because they can, they can ultimately get that information uh, through slightly more kind of hackish means if they want to create something, something like that. But really, again, the information is information that's already on the web. So there's a kind of limit to what they can do in a... Yeah, I guess um, be interesting to see what what kinds of uses you're worried about in that timetable data that that, um, that you can see or that you that, yeah. It's probably also worth saying that the um, uh, the license, the open data license, specific, specifically prohibits people impersonating the publisher. That's what it does do. It so it gives you that protection. So, for example, if you're Fusion Lifestyle, you can't pretend to be Fusion Lifestyle and, public, and, and have timetables up there. So um, if there's reputational damage to do with the way that they're presenting that data or anything to do with that, that would really be on the, you know, the, that data user. So if it's Change for Life, for example, that do it wrong, 
um, that would, that's on change for life, really. To, and that's, pretty, that's really why there's not much of an issue that usually occurs with this stuff, because either you're a really big data user and you've got a lot to lose, in which case you'll do a, a big job of trying to make sure you're doing everything right, or you're a very small data user that no one's going to look at. And if you're doing something wrong, then no one really notices. And so generally what we found, especially in other sectors, is that the bigger the data user, the harder they'll try to do what they're doing right um, because of their reputation. And if it's small, it doesn't matter. The other two things I'd add to that are, um, again, if you look at tra travel, you have uh, a lot of apps on the App Store that use that bus timetable data in different ways. And the ones that gain an audience are the ones that, that, that work well, that are trustworthy, that are safe, and they kind of rise to the top of the rankings, and they're the things that ten people tend to see. The ones that, and in travel, it's not that they use it in a kind of dangerous way, it's that they just, the, the user experience might not be very good they tend to kind of sink to the bottom of the rankings and you don't tend to see them. So from the op open data side, I think that's, that would be what we'd expect to see in this sector. There is control over who can do bookings and who can't do bookings. So that's, that, it's not like a free-for-all on anybody using the data in a bookable way. That control should still exist with the activity provider. Okay, hopefully a quick one. Um, the four million people that have signed up to Change for Life, where does that number come from? So that is directly from Public Health England. That's the, that's the number of people that are engaged in the campaign as a whole. So Change for Life isn't just about physical activity. It's about healthy eating habits and, and a whole raft of other things. Um, so that's the, that's the total pot of people that are engaged in Change for Life rather than just the activity finder. And that's come directly from Public Health England. Great. Uh, does it go against open active principles to open up some data, but not all? No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I uh, don't have it in front of me, but we, at the Open Data Institute, we, just, we describe data as existing on a spectrum from closed to shared to, to open. Um, and there's obviously a very valid case for why you would not want to open up things like your employee records or your contracts or information that's commercially sensitive. So that information should usually sit at the kind of closed end of the spectrum and you should have kind of tight controls around who, uh, who can access that and it should probably be people within your organization. There's then data that might sit in the middle of that spectrum that you're comfortable for people to use in a different way, uh, provided you put some kind of control mechanism around that. So uh, that could be um, uh, working with a researcher to look at your participation data to help you understand um, you know, trends and, and, and things that you can improve. right? But you want to only share that data with controls around it. And then there's data that can exist at the open end of the spectrum, which is, you know, there's no reason why it can't be in the public domain that you can't put an open license on and you, and you don't need to have such a rigid, rigid control around who can access or use it or share it. Um, um, it, it was more around, so um, if you're exposing all your session data for your upcoming um, sessions, um, you know, there may be some sessions that you wouldn't want to advertise to the whole world because your members might want to, um, you know, have priority over booking those. Is, is there any reason why, sh you know, you should, should publish everything, all your sessions? Yeah, I mean, I think that would be on a case-by-case -case basis for that organisation to decide what, what they do and don't publish. And um, depending on how that's set up, you know, you may or may not have that, that control in doing that. Um, and some booking systems even already have or are working on uh, having that filtering in place. Uh, so we, we, do, we are aware of particular circumstances where there are, there's a villa that can only be uh, uh, booked by particular employees of an organization. You obviously don't want that villa to be available for the public and open data. Um, and so some systems are working on that filtering and it's actually prerequisite before publishers go live, making sure that some of that private data isn't, isn't included. Obviously, generally speaking, anything that you would advertise on a poster or in public or on timetables in your leisure center, you'd want to be included in the feed because you're getting more people to, to see that and get more people active as a result. But we wouldn't suggest just the cleaning schedule or cleaning rotor from your system being in there, uh, for example. Um, so uh, last two, we're going to try and do these quite quickly because there's only two. Um, uh, how readily available are white label aggregators that could plug into our website? Um, this is a question that um, I think we probably don't. I mean, those those aggregators exist. Uh, so Tom is in the room, who has worked with uh, Public Health England on on their activity finder component, um, and there are other organisations that are doing similar things. So those things do exist. Yeah. 
So there's a lot of people in the room that can help you with that question. If you find them at lunch, then uh, actually we can, we can help you with that uh, at the end. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, what are the non-technical commercial barriers to bookable open active sessions? Do you want to take that one? The non-technical commercial barriers to open active sessions. Um, I mean, I think the biggest barrier we can see is that we want to help everybody in this room overcome is, is, is that discussion about what the commercial relationship should look like. And it's making sure that you as the activity provider can find the kinds of things that you want to enable booking with and that conversation can happen. So um, uh, we've been speaking to a couple of activity providers about putting together an open call to, to facilitate that. So you know, the, the activity, activity provider could say, say the terms of what they want to see from an aggregator. Um, promote that widely and we'd be happy to help people do that. Um, so I'm not sure if I have answered the question on that. If the person who asked it could raise their hand. Yeah. Uh, I guess the question is, uh, um, is the data really open if every session that you need, to, every different provider that you use requires a commercial agreement? So we might address that question in the next bit. Yeah. So let's go through the next bit and if I haven't then Come, come find me and we can hopefully answer it more clearly. So, am I good to click slides? Uh, yeah. And we're, it, we're around all day, so if people have other questions at lunch or uh, in, any, in any of the other breaks, then please come find us. Um, so why, why are we focusing on booking? So that, that bit I was talking about earlier was mainly about the open data, so making the timetables more, more usable, uh, more open for people to use. Um, so why are we focusing on, on booking as an initiative? So the first reason really is we think it will lead to a, a more smoother user experience. So reducing the number of clicks that that customer who's found activity needs to go through in order to reserve their place and take part. So reducing that friction and making it more likely that the person uh, looking at activity can take part in it. <coughs> we think it, if by cracking booking, we can create incentives for innovators, for startups, for um, people who want to create new things to do that because it leads to, to uh, I guess, a better, uh, to, to more value for those innovators in order to do that. And we think that if you crack those first two things, so, so getting a better consumer experience, more innovation, that should ultimately make lives better for the activity providers. So those two things should lead to activity providers reaching more customers, reaching different customers, filling quiet times of the day. So um, you know, things like social prescribing, does that help you reach new customers that you can't already reach? Um, things like insurance or em employee wellbeing, does it help you reach people that you can't currently reach in a different way? Um, and does booking help close that gap? So that's why we're focusing on booking. And this hopefully will answer your, your earlier question about the distinction between these two things. So the first step for most activity providers is to publish the timetables openly. And then the second step is to enable booking on those activities. That's, that's the direction that we're going in. You can publish your timetables openly and you, you can choose not to enable booking if you want to. So there's a two-step process and you, and you have control over whether you enable booking and who you enable it with. And just to kind of give you a sense of how that might look from a user perspective. So this is a screenshot of how the data, if, if, if all you've done is publish the, the timetable data openly and that's getting used by a third party. Um, this is how it would look to a, to, a, to a user. So they might key in their, their postcode, they'll find the activity that they're interested in, and there's all that information on that activity. And that red box would say something like more info. What, the, what that user would need to do then is, is click on that more info uh, link. They would then be redirected to the activity provider's website in order to book that, access, that, book that activity and confirm their place. So it works, it's not seamless. So there's a bit of friction there for the customer. So if you were to enable booking, the way that would look then is instead of seeing more info, they would see book now. And that consumer could click on that link and they'd be taken to a guest checkout and they could fill in the details, and book that activity and they don't really need to go anywhere else. They've got everything they need to 
to, to go to that activity, they know that their place has been reserved and you're reducing that friction for that, that person to take part. So once you've captured that person's attention, once you know that they're motivated to, to do that activity, this is about making it easier for them to, to follow through on that and not get distracted by what's on the TV or, or some other activity. And the final, final point we want to make here is that, that all this work is, is for all of you. So this, is, this was Tim Berners-Lee at the opening ceremony of the Olympics tweeting out that this is for everyone. Um, that's what the work of Open Active is. It's for everybody in this room. Um, and so we're hugely appreciative of all the input that, that those people have been actively engaged in this process. All the input that you've put into this so far, um, that's what's helping us get to where we are. Um, there are more of you that we want to feed into this. And so thank you for everybody who has come here today. Please see this as an opportunity to, to provide that feedback and help us make this better, because ultimately it's all for you. Um, and just, I guess, to have one of you sort of talk about why you've got engaged in this and, 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 and um, where you see this going, um, I'd just like to ask Sean, from, Sean Maguire from Legend to, to come up and say a couple of words. I'll take that. No, that's all right. Thank you. Right, well, yeah, so who's this scruffy guy? Um, we've been involved in this uh, topic since a since good uh, year and a half ago. And one of the things just listening to today and, and uh, observing the last year, I, I feel, is that the description of what we're doing as something around open data I think is somewhat misleading and, and worrying. So for me, the, the first bit of noise that I've been generating is, let's try not call it open data. Let's instead call it open opportunities and open bookings, because it's got nothing to do with personal data. And with last year's focus on GDPR, that is, of course, a, an alarm that immediately goes off. And for us to make this really effective, it's to ensure that all operators are comfortable and, and opt in. And that's one of the reasons, actually, we got involved, is to facilitate that. So why? Why did we get involved as a vendor? Firstly, we feel it was compelling just to support the industry. But also, uh, especially in front of uh, key stakeholders, government, Sport England, Public Health England, uh, and others, you know, too often we hear those lame expressions about we're, you know, behind on technology, etc. And I, I simply totally disagree. So this could be, in my view, one of the most important projects that we've delivered as an industry. I really mean that. As consumers, i.e. the aggregators and the third-party innovators, we have to seize the opportunity to, to open up these new channels for exercise. And already, based on what we're seeing through the innovator labs and through the number of parties that are innovating, there's no doubt that there's great demand for that. But as providers, we've got to engage with those innovators. It's a key thing for me, and I feel that We've got two choices. We can either hide from it, be fearful of it, or we can engage with it and embrace it. And it's my view that if you don't embrace it, then there's every risk that those who do will out-innovate you as an operator. We don't know what the next big thing is going to be. Who is the next... Bill Gates or Steve Jobs still in his pajamas that's busy coding up an app and what that might mean to our industry. But let's encourage and make that easier. So we, we feel open data will help make innovation inexpensive and we wish to encourage everybody to embrace it. We think supporting innovation uh, is, is really important. Um, especially in front of those key stakeholders I mentioned. But another reason is to tap into the enormous investment that's already being made by uh, bodies like Sport England, like Public Health England, 
there's an enormous investment going into these channels which drive custom to your facilities. And thinking back uh, to last year with the This Girl Can uh, campaign, it was a real pity that operators simply didn't know that the campaign was about to be launched and hence couldn't incorporate it into their marketing plans, into their in-facility communications, but also couldn't make use of it in terms of maximizing those who showed interest through this girl, the, the This Girl Can um, campaign. This year is different. We've got Public Health England already preparing, and all of us, Tom at Gladstone and I, and others in the industry, thinking about ways that we can uh, support the Change for Life 2019, which starts at the end of May with preparations, but gets into full swing in summer. There's millions of pounds going into it. There's two things we want to achieve through it. One is we want to drive the maximum number of visitors into the centers, but also we want to know who's responded so that we can actually evidence and encourage yet more investment in future through the evidence based on how many people have responded. Without this initiative, we can't achieve that so we're actually shooting ourselves in the feet because we're not going to get more investment. Um, and finally, this process is led by customers. It's led by operators. The vendors like us, we're trying to make it easier for customers, but we're not sitting there making decisions in a vacuum. We've engaged an enormous number of customers. We had customers involved in each of the processes to date, and ultimately, we're also trying to ensure that customers have the power to prevent the sort of mishap that has occurred and the sort of fear that we are currently experiencing when I'm out in the marketplace, where we're fearful of the aggregators and what it might mean to our margins. We're making sure that customers are in control, that the levers of what facilities are bookable, um, and how they structure those relationships with third parties is within their control. In addition to that, we feel one of the reasons to really get stuck in with the detail is to ensure that we can have a say and perhaps even try and reduce the scope of the customer's own involvement and due diligence by having a relationship with the third party whereby we ask some difficult questions, make sure that there isn't an inadvertent denial of service risk through just bad coding by the third party, or making sure that the third party has some sort of information security process or management system, or at least standard, that we know, not, in, not the least of which is where is the data actually being stored. So we feel we have that responsibility to help to ensure that there is some sort of gatekeeping for our customers. But ultimately, um, it's, we've been involved in order to try and drive what we think is going to be a, a really powerful outcome for the benefit of and greater good of the industry. So if that's useful, Richard. Great, John. Thank you very much. So we're going to break for lunch now. Um, so thank you for sitting through those presentations. Hopefully we've got a good bit of scene setting there. We're going to break for lunch. We're going to be back by uh, 1.30. Um, so, as Nick said earlier, lunch is upstairs, uh, so go grab something to eat. When we come back, we're going to dig into the booking spec in a bit more detail and, and get your feedback on that. And, and over lunch, hands up those of you in, in the room who are kind of on the innovator data user side uh, and are, would be interested in, in making activities bookable. Show of hands. So there's quite a few of those kinds of organizations in the room. So I think back to that, that early question about how you can find those kinds of organization. Have a chat with a few of those guys over lunch um, and be back here at 1.30. Thanks, everybody.